From our studio at the corner of 8th and Walton in Bentonville, Arkansas, welcome to Saturday Morning Meeting, where we cover Walmart, Sam's Clubs, and the consumer product companies that are represented on their racks and shelves throughout the country and around the world. I'm Derek Ridenauer, and our focus is on insights, trends, and best practices that will help you as a supplier better manage your business with the world's largest retailer. Thank you for joining us. And coming up today, you may have heard about the supplier portal allowing retail coverage, better known as Spark. We have Mike Grain from Walmart. We'll stop by to explain what that program is all about and when you can get it as a supplier. Also, Andy Shook from the Harvest Group will be here to tell first-time suppliers things that they should know, and we're going to talk about the Get on the Shelf program. But first, your headlines. Target is closing the price gap on Walmart. That's according to the latest Kantar Retail semi-annual pricing study conducted in June, which found that the prices at Walmart stores are on average 2.4% less than those at Target. Only 19% of the items were more than 10% more expensive at Target. Walmart has long been the king of everyday low pricing, while Target is known for offering more aesthetically pleasing merchandise at a higher price. Recently, though, Target has narrowed the gap in pricing through the increased use of promotional price cuts. Walmart is number one in back-to-school savings. ABC News reported this week that ShopMart, a magazine from Consumer Reports, found that out of four national retailers, Walmart emerged as the lowest price winner in basic back-to-school shopping, with Target following closely behind. The magazine found that Walmart had the lowest price for six of the items, including Elmer's washable disappearing purple glue stick in a three-pack for $2.94 at Staples. Same product as $5.99. That glue was one of seven products at the biggest difference, or with the biggest difference in price at stores. Another big difference in price was for the Norcom notebook paper. At Walmart, it costs 82 cents for 150 sheets. College ruled at Office Depot costs 301, a 73% difference between the two stores. Walmart has big plans for e-commerce. Walmart is looking to catch up to other retailers in the e-commerce game. That's according to Walmart CEO of global e-commerce Neil Ash during an interview at Fortune's Brainstorm Tech Conference in Aspen, Colorado on Tuesday. Mr. Ash said that it would be foolish for Walmart to run away from 10,000 stores or 240 million customers, but neither does he want Walmart.com to be merely an add-on. The best strategy, he said, is to create a seamless experience in which a consumer will come to Walmart whenever, wherever makes sense to him or her. Walmart fashionistas unite. As a follow-up to a story from last week, fashion blogger Frederike Spurl recently took umbrage at retail analyst Walter Loeb's insistence that Walmart has, quote, no fashion message, unquote. Sproul put together several inexpensive, chic, professional outfits from Walmart's apparel assortment and showcased them at Forbes, noting that all shoppers need is a bit of creativity. Walmart Canada is using a multi-channel publication to reach its customers. The solution is a multi-channel consumer lifestyle publication entitled Walmart Live Better that comprises a bi-monthly print magazine, an iPad version, and a website with constantly refreshed content. The print publication is available free in stores with a print run of one million, making it the largest circulation lifestyle magazine in Canada. Walmart is number one in home textiles. Home Textiles Today's Warren Schauberg recently offered some remarks on Walmart's recent ranking as the top home textiles retailer. Schauberg noted that despite Walmart's reputation as a, quote, functional, unquote, retailer, consumers know a good thing when they see it. That said, the wonderful world of sheets and towels has not always been kind to them. As with any fashion goods, Walmart has struggled with the classification, never quite getting the balance of fashion and function quite right to meet the demographics of its consumer customer base. Walmart India unable to meet some sourcing requirements. The Indian Express reports that Walmart is unable to meet the country's sourcing regulations. The world's largest retailer has expressed its inability to the government on meeting the sourcing norm in the multi-brand segment that requires 30% procurement from small industries, stating it can only procure about 20%. When contacted, Walmart India spokeswoman said, quote, we are still very early in the process of FDI, but we are excited by the opportunity in front of us. 
We will continue to work with the government to better understand the rules that exist for FDI and we appreciate the government's willingness to consider our request for clarity on conditions contained in the new FDI policy. Coming up, Mike Grain from Walmart as well as Bill Akins from Rockfish to talk about the SPARC program. And up next, Andy Shook from the Harvest Group on what all first-time suppliers need to know. And we're going to talk about the Get on the Shelf program. That is straight ahead. Today's show has been sponsored in part by 8th and Walton the premier destination for Walmart supplier education. 8th and Walton offers a variety of services including new supplier onboarding, scorecard optimization, and analysis and reporting. Visit 8thandwalton.com forward slash services to learn more. Welcome back, and we are joined in the studio now by Andy Shook from the Harvest Group. And Andy, thanks for coming in today. You've been at this for a very long time, 25 years now. Kind of yeah. tell us about your career and kind of some of the things that you have going on at Harvest. Sure. Well, my career kind of started off with, uh, I actually came into this whole thing with, through DSD, um, with pizza. Um, I started off with Tony's Red Baron Pizza, and then kind of worked my way into uh, Coke, did that for a little bit. And then I actually ended up at Kraft, and that's when uh, Kraft had just bought out Tombstone Pizza Company. So if you remember Tombstone Pizza Company, they're a Wisconsin-owned company that Kraft bought out. And I came into that organization through DSD, going to stores, um, dealing with uh, frozen food managers and grocery managers and store managers at that level. And then I uh, began working my way up as a district manager and then eventually worked my way into a marketing manager position. And that's kind of how I came out here. My first real marketing job or my first uh, um, account manager job was calling a Walmart. And what I did is I uh, kind of deepened my skills in Excel and data and analysis and stuff. And when this role came open, back in 98, I think Walmart had about 1,000 stores, Supercenter stores, so frozen stores out here. So we were back in the days when we would go to the Walmart shows and we would actually cook up pizza. And that was back when DiGiorno was a big hit. So we cooked up DiGiorno pizzas and did that. And uh, so I've been with uh, Kraft and then uh, just recently with Kellogg's. And now I've been with the Harvest Group uh, for about the last three years. So let's talk a little bit about what the Harvest Group is and some of the companies that you're working with. Sure. Well, Harvest Group, if you go to our website, um, harvestg.com, um, you can learn all of the kind of ins and outs about our company in more detail and that kind of thing. I'll just kind of give you my my picture, my idea of this company. It was really started by Bill Waitsman and Ross Cully about seven, eight years ago. And their vision was, um, they came from big CPG companies like many of us that work at that company. And their vision was to really take small to meet, or take that CPG um, type network where you've got marketing, you've got replenishment, you've got all of these different um, um, people and, and entities that kind of help the account manager do better in their role. I mean, you can't possibly know everything about marketing that you need to know or replenishment or all these different things as one person. So as they developed this um, around the account manager, they kind of put this company together around that philosophy and that idea. So what we do is we have enough people in our office. We've got a marketing department, replenishment. We've got retail. We've also got analytics. So we've got all of those resources around us to help our, our account managers, people like myself, to help our clients uh, grow and build their business. And that was really what the vision was, was to take small to medium-sized companies and help them and bring that, that, the, those resources surround them and help them grow and build their business like a CPG company. And that was kind of the idea behind it. Okay. Um, season two for Walmart, the Get On The Shelf program, kind of right up your alley in terms of helping um, smaller companies or even brand new companies get on the shelf. What, what oh, yeah, um, that, are some of the things that you would be working with and telling first-time suppliers? Well, this is the area that I'm working in. So I'm working with people who either haven't had business at Walmart or uh, maybe have a small business and are trying to figure out how to grow it and how to build it. So that first-time supplier coming into Walmart, I think the first thing that they need to do is they need to look at where they're at right now. What does their market share look like? Uh, what kind of business are they doing out in the marketplace right now? Walmart does a really good job with companies that have already kind of established themselves and kind of figured out who they are in the marketplace, but they don't do as good of a job with someone who comes in with something new and different and then expects Walmart to go out and promote it for them or figure out how it's going to sell on the shelf. I mean, the stores, you got over 100,000 square foot. It just gets lost on the shelf. So you've really got to work hard to make sure that you're ready to go to Walmart at the right time. Um, from your experience, how does Walmart usually receive those new items? Boy, it, it really depends. Um, I, I think one of the things that they're doing is, is they first want to take a look at the company and they want to know that this company is really ready. They've got enough size and enough mass to really take over um, bringing that product to Walmart, right? Um, they've got the resources behind it and all those types of things. I think the second thing is, is 
over in the food industry or over in the food side, grocery and, and frozen and refrigerated over in that area, Walmart is really looking at regional type players. So if you've got a story, I mean, even if it's 10 stores or 20 stores, um, I, I, had a, I had a meat supplier that called me up out of uh, Maryland and uh, they said, you know, we really want to get into Walmart. I said, well, tell me a little bit about your marketplace. Where are you kind of at right now? And they started kind of sharing with me what stores and what area they were in. And I'm like going, man, that touches three of Walmart's DCs. But neither one of those DCs could we even go into because they only have a few stores Probably in each so of those small. DCs. And I said, you know what, guys? I said, this is what I would recommend. Walmart has, um, if you go to uh, walmartstores.com, you go to the supplier side and you go to local supplier, you can go in there and you can become a local supplier and just deliver DSD to those stores and start seeing whether or not your product's relevant within a Walmart store. Work with the store manager to see if, um, if, if your product really makes sense. Rather than trying to go through a buyer or trying to go through the corporate offices, but maybe going through that local program rather than trying to go through the, the buyer. Now, if your product is more relevant and it covers enough area, then it may make sense to come in and talk with a buyer um, or talk with someone like myself that can help you introduce you to a buyer or introduce the, you know, that kind of thing. But build the story first. You really got to build the story first. Walmart's not the place you want to try to build the story. <laughs> um, what are the prospects today versus five, ten years ago uh, for a brand new supplier just getting into Walmart? I, I would say that right now it's, it's, it's really good. Um, Walmart's bringing in a lot of new suppliers and they're, they're bringing in a lot of variety of products. Um, you know, they went through Project Impact, so they've kind of gone the other way. Now, I don't know how much longer that's going to last, but I'll tell you this, if, if you're a female-owned business, you should be knocking on Walmart's doors right now uh, because they are looking for those types of businesses. If you have a sustainability message, Walmart is also, you know, we found that Walmart's also looking for that as well. But really that female-owned business, minority-owned business, uh, Walmart's going to support those types of businesses. And if if you've got that story and you've got mass and enough to really, you know, your, your product's doing well in the marketplace right now, I think now is a really good time to come in and talk with these buyers. And how hard is it to get a meeting? <laughs> <laughs> and what does it take uh, to get that first meeting? In my experience, it, what it really takes is, is um, in, over on the food side right now, the buyers are, are very much caught up in Nielsen, IRI, and, and data. If you've got a Nielsen story, it's much easier. So if you've got a story that says, I've got this much ACV, my product is moving within this region of the US, it's much easier to get an appointment with a buyer. If you don't have the Nielsen story, it's a little bit hard right now because the buyers have another piece of information that they just didn't have before. You know, in the past it was, hey, my product sells great. Well, based on what? The buyers really didn't know. I mean, they didn't have any data. They had nothing to really kind of check on that item to see what it's doing out in the marketplace. They really had to take the supplier's word for it. Well, now they can check on that. They can kind of find out how you're doing, how you're positioned, and, and where you're going in the marketplace. And, and they are looking at that, and they are checking on that. Now, is there a way to get the IRI data without subscribing? And, and the, re the reason I ask that, if, if I'm a small-time supplier, mm -hmm. and I probably don't have the resources to go out and subscribe to the Nielsen IRI. Is there somebody that can kind of lead me, direct me, and, and give me some insight as to what, what those numbers may be? It, I mean, obviously, you want to go buy it. I mean, yeah, that's, that's the going and buying it is, the, I mean, that's, that's really the only way that I know of um, to get the information in the data. And really, it's just knowing your company and kind of knowing where you're at. I, I talked with a supplier yesterday um, that you know, is, is talking with a buyer, and he's got like almost zero Nielsen IRI data. Well, his product is huge in convenience and in other channels. Okay, he's doing great in that. And it's about a $20, $25 million a year company. So a good sized company. I mean, they're not a small and they're more of a regional player. So how do you get over that hump? How do you get to that place where the buyer says, okay, I realize we don't have Nielsen IRI, but you are doing great here. That's where I think you got to bring that story in. I mean, he was showing me his Facebook account. He's got 385,000 likes on there. The product is in, in schools. So the kids are already drinking this product, they're already tasting it, and so there's a story there. You just gotta get over that, that IRI hump, I think, with the buyer to try to get them to a place where they can so kind of see ways, that there they're... are ways around it. That's, that's I think there are. You sense. just gotta be creative and, and innovative. Another thing, too, that, you know, one of the things that the Harvest Group does with our clients is, um, if a client isn't really sure where their product fits in the marketplace or what it does, um, we've, got, um, we've got the ability to kind of help them with, with marketing, um, but then also to look at insights to try to figure out where does this product fit. 
And you know, we've, we've got a, a, a group within our company that actually does that. So you can take your product and if you're like not really sure who your customer is and, and really how this product is moving across the US, we've got an insights department that can go find, answer those questions. Now by answering those questions, we bring that information to a buyer. It helps the buyer in understanding kind of where you've placed yourself and where you've positioned yourself, maybe without all of that IRI data and that Nielsen data. So there, there are different ways to get there. It's just, you just we just try you to help them figure. You gotta be creative and, and we try to help in all those different areas to try to get our clients to that place. Okay, Matt Pfeiffer from Ethan Walton recently wrote an article, because, and we're gonna go back to Get on the Shelf now, um, that in some cases, and, and especially with the program Get on the Shelf that Walmart's having, is there too much emphasis to get on the shelf and less emphasis with, with how do you stay on the shelf? Because getting in is, is easy, to, well, is probably more easily done than staying on the shelf. You make it in, you get that first mod set, you're good for a year, sales don't justify it, you don't yeah. have the resources. How do you stay on the shelf? You know, when I was with the CPG companies, it was all about replenishment, um, it was about you know making sure the shelf was full, hitting all the metrics within Walmart, and doing all those kinds of things. Although those things are important, for a smaller supplier that's only doing 0.8 units per store per week or one unit per store per week, they're just kind of getting things going. They're in a totally different situation. You don't have to worry about replenishment. It's replenishing just fine. There's more than enough product on the shelf. There's enough product in the DCs if it happened to go into DC. There's plenty of stuff out there. They've got to figure out how am I going to get that product to move off the shelf. Maybe they've overextended themselves. They've gone in too many stores. You know, uh, and, and what, what we do what we do at our office, we really work with um, marketing. What are the different tools that we can use within Walmart to help drive that? Is it, you know, can, outside of Walmart, is it radio, is it television? Um, what are the things that the big CPG companies are doing? Trying to take some of those thoughts and, and ideas and trying to bring that to our smaller suppliers, trying to help them with that. The main thing is, is that you've, you've got to do the things within, within your budget, within marketing, that are going to go drive those sales and keep that product on the shelf. The buyers can't do it. They can't make people buy your product, which means you've got to bring people into the store knowing to come look for your product and come buy your product. Whether that's through demos, whether it's through um, couponing, FSIs, whatever those things are, we try to help develop a plan and put that together to try to make it as successful as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, beyond the obvious developing a great product and obviously making sure it's there, what is one of the things that you see most new suppliers kind of overlooking um, as they're preparing to do business with Walmart? We to, talked about the replenishment yeah. and marketing, but what are, what are some other key things that you think they're missing? Shipping, logistics, getting that figured out, the, the true cost of what it's going to cost to ship to 42 DCs if they get nationwide. You know, they're shipping less than truckload. Um, they're not shipping full pallets. They might be shipping 20 or 30 cases, which means you might be mailing it um, and doing those types of things. So there's a lot of costs. There's some costs involved in Walmart that, that I think suppliers are looking over initially. They're thinking that, you know, like other suppliers, they're just going to ship to a couple DCs and they'll be fine. But all of a sudden they get into 42, there's a lot of cost involved in that. Um, I, I think the other thing too is just understanding that, that on the shelf at Walmart, you can get lost. How am I going to bring consumers in there? And what's my cost to do that? To get consumers, when they're walking in the store, they're saying, I want that product. Right. Well, I know I, I've been asked in buyer meetings by a buyer, what are you going to do to tell the customer that your products are in our store? Exactly. One of the biggest questions I often get. And, and, and you work for a larger company. So, I mean, you know, imagine a company that, you know, is maybe doing a million dollars a year, total business across the U.S. They come into Walmart, and these are the smaller suppliers. They come into Walmart, and, you know, now they're trying to figure out how to get that, get that product done and get that product moving. Um, do you think a lot of pain would go away if suppliers just kind of realize that first of all I need to be a little more patient and I need to do kind of what you're saying let's go build this in, in, in 10 stores expand it and just slowly kind of grassroots grow that up or do or should they be that patient? It, it depends it, but sometimes that is the best plan is to really work within a small segment of stores, go do the right things at, those at that store level and start building from there and grow from there and then and go out from there. Um, that's, sometimes that's the best plan. And store of the community, how do you see that factoring in? And would, you, would you even point a new supplier to go and look at some of the store of the community reports? Obviously they can't get into retail link, but. Yeah, it, you know, store of the community is an important part of it, but again, here's part of the problem with store of the community is, is that all of a sudden you're spread out to 42 DCs, maybe you're only in 20 stores or 10 stores in each of those DCs, it gets very expensive to ship the product out. So, you know, sometimes a store of the community can make a difference, and obviously it does for, you know, um, uh, you know, for some products, but 
um, it, th that does get a little bit tougher. And again, you're really kind of working within the confines of what the buyer is doing and kind of what their goals are. And I think, you know, that that's kind of another important part too. Is when a when a when a supplier brings a product to Walmart, they've got their own ideas, their own plans, and the direction that they want to go. And sometimes they forget that that buyer also has their plans, their directions, and where they want to go. And sometimes the two aren't matching up at this time. Now that doesn't mean a year from now or two years from now those things may match up perfectly. Um, and but that sometimes is just understanding kind of where that buyer is going and trying to figure out how do I fit in with the goals, with the intention, with the with the where this buyer is really going with these products and, and with their category, how does my line fit in with that, with that goal? I want to switch gears on you a little bit here. Um, a lot of consolidation going on in the industry. Nash Finch just announced this week that they're going to be merging with another company. Uh, Harris Teeter acquired by Kroger, so that, that marriage is going to be over here in the next year. With all that retail consolidation going on, and then you also look on the other side of the e-commerce with what Amazon is doing, all the things uh, that are going on, uh, we talked last week about sloppy stores, uh, that Walmart has, mm -hmm. and, and Walmart's not alone. There are those retailers that have those sloppy stores. Out of all of that that's going on, what, do you, what concerns you the most? Boy, the, the thing that concerns me the most is, is really, you know, I, I came through this whole thing through DSD, right? So I'm a store guy. I mean, that's kind of where I started, and, and, I, and I love being in the stores and, and kind of seeing how things are done at store level. Um, I, I think what concerns me the most is just what's happening at store level. Just the, it's got to get on the shelf. You know, it's, it's got to be on the shelf. And, you know, I know the Spark program is something that Walmart's doing to try to, to fix some of that. And they're trying to do some different programs like this and that. But, you know, fixing the problems out there and whatnot, not all of these suppliers have the money to send somebody into stores and, and to do all of these programs. They really, you know, they may not have the resources to do that. So how is Walmart going to take care of that at store level? How can we, you know, I've got a small supplier that has a water product in Walmart that moves really well, but it has tons of ghost inventory. Well, they don't have money to send retail in. There's just not enough profit in it, you know, for them. So how do we fix that? How do we, how do we take care of that ghost problem? You know, we've been calling the stores and trying to get it done that way um, because we, don't, we can't really figure out any other way to do it that's economical. Um, but is there a way in which we can get some of those things corrected? But I think it's really going to be important is what happens at store level more than anything else. But I will tell store. you this, with all the consolidation, it's good to be calling a Walmart. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they've, got, they've got the best consolidation ever. They're, you know, they're not splitting up. They're just kind of one big entity. And it's really nice being in Bentonville. And I've got being able one to final question for you. Sure. What advice would you give to a brand new supplier who may be stuck in a basement of a trade show? And how, how do you take and move out of that basement and get in front of a buyer? Uh, such as Walmart or any other major retailer, but how do you really start to get noticed? Be patient um, and, and grow your business. Do everything you can to make it so that when you come to Walmart, Walmart's got customers asking for that product. Um, either whether it's a regional, um, they're asking for it regionally, or whether they're asking it across the nation because you've got some uh, you know, um, um, video or something that you're doing you know, on, um, on, the, on the internet, um, that you're drawing customers to that product. But Get people aware of your product and knowing what it is so that when you come to Walmart, the buyers are asking you to bring your product to them. I mean, that's, that, that's really the best advice that I can give to suppliers. You've, you've got to grow your business and get it going before you come to Walmart. And you've got to get it established and make sure that it's successful so that when a customer comes in and they see that, they say, I've seen that product on this. I've heard of that. I, I, I want to try that. And I'm so glad it's now here at Walmart. That's the right time to go to Walmart. It's not the right time is not to go when you're just trying to introduce a product or get it so going. Last step, not first step. Yeah, I mean the, P the, the big the big companies, the big CPG companies, they spend millions and millions of dollars advertising, and they get their product in there right away because of that money that they're spending advertising. Small companies, you got to get down and dirty, get it going, get that thing built up, and then you bring it into Walmart when it's the right time. Okay. And if somebody wants to contact you, they can contact you at the Harvest Group. Yeah, the they can website. contact me at the Harvest Group through the website. Um, you know, we work with um, we work with small suppliers that are just trying to get in. That's kind of my niche and what I do. And then we've got another side of our company that actually works with uh, uh, companies that may, might be doing anywhere from ten million to as much as hundred million dollars a year at Walmart that are looking to build a customer team. So, like, if you've got a company where you've been sending a VP of sales into uh, into Walmart. Um, and you're like, you know, we're just not getting enough traction there. We've taken companies that were like the number three brand or the number four brand and built them up to the number two, number one brand. We built companies up to where we sold them. Um, you know, we, it's, it's a combination of different things that we do, but we take that expertise that we have and we use that for small to medium-sized companies to help build them and grow their business at Walmart and Sam's Club. 
Well, Andy, thank you very much for coming in. You heard Andy talk about the Spark program. Coming up next, we're going to talk with Mike Green from Walmart, as well as Bill Akins from Rockfish, and they're going to explain what Spark is all about. Stay tuned. This week's episode is sponsored by Store of the Community. We help grow sales and market share for some of the biggest brands in the world, one store at a time. Visit our website at storeofthecommunity.com. And welcome back. We are joined by Mike Green from Walmart. He is the Director of Supplier Collaboration, also Bill Akins from Rockfish. He is the uh, Vice President of Client Services and Michael Clark, the uh, Director of Retail Strategy at Kellogg's. Thank you all for coming in today. Mike, I want to start with you because we've been talking about Spark a little bit. We've talked with some other people about it, but let's talk about what Spark is and why, why need it. Yeah, so Spark stands for Supplier Portal Allowing Retail Coverage. Um, it's a platform that recognizes the fact that we have suppliers in our stores every day uh, that are trying to do basically the same, some of the same things we are. We're trying to make sure their products are on the store. They work very collaboratively with the store, and this really just recognizes that those suppliers are in the store doing that work and make sure we have processes and training and technology to support the kinds of things they're trying to get done. So when's it going to roll out? When will it be av available? So there's two versions of it. One is a version called Spark Lite that's available to account handlers, replenishment people, salespeople of our supplier partners today. Uh, they can get on to our walmartsupplierportal.com and actually register for that. It gives them the ability to view in real-time inventory information into our stores. That's available today. Um, the second one, which is what we call Spark 2.0, is basically giving them the ability to be able to do that same inventory view information, also allowing them to print labels if there are labels that are off the shelf, allows them to generate a pick of product down from the sales floor, allows them to go and pick that product from the back room and stock it, uh, and also does some other inventory adjustment work that really helps to drive on shelf availability. Um, which suppliers are participating in this event now? Because it's not rolled out to everybody, right? Yeah, we started, we started pretty slowly. We started last July in about uh, three or four markets uh, with a Telzon-based solution, which is the device that we use in our, for our associates in our stores. Uh, we started out with some of the suppliers that uh, obviously you know about, the Procter & Gamble's, the Kellogg's of the world, the Nestle's of the world, um, and also third-party service providers like Acosta, Crossmark, Advantage, Anderson, some of those folks. So we had a total of about 20 suppliers that were very actively involved with the program, and they've all played a very important leadership role. Uh, as we roll it out more nationally with a bring your own device, we will obviously be expanding that to the suppliers that make sense. So uh, how is this different from what they're doing today? Well, fundamentally, it's not different than what they're doing today. Um, what this does is really recognize that they're doing this work today. Uh, I think it gives them much more real-time inventory information. Uh, one of the challenges that they have is some of the inventory information that's available to the retail link could be six hours old at best. It could be 24 or 48 hours old. Um, and what this does is actually puts the power of real-time information into the supplier's hands, just like uh, us, our stores have today. Uh, so it really recognizing those suppliers are in our stores trying to actually do this work and gives them much more real-time information and the ability to actually take action on things that they see that need to be addressed. So if I have the app, I go into a store, can I order? You cannot order product with this product with this program. Um, obviously, our buyers are still ultimately going to be responsible for ordering product, and our stores are going to be responsible for ordering product. However, what you can do is if there are situations that you have a ghost inventory or phantom inventory situation, you can make or recommended uh, adjustments to that inventory to make sure that you the ordering process begins. Uh, so it, it doesn't let you order directly but it lets you adjust the inventory information to make sure that it's correct and accurate for that store, for that item, and that allows that, the replenishment system to kick back in again. Okay, you said it was in pilot. When's it gonna be national? Uh, it will be national in August. Uh, our plan is to begin the national rollout in August. I should probably say it be better that way. Uh, our plan right now is, barring any unforeseen issues, is we'll be in chain before the end of the year. Now, not just anybody can sign up for this and go download the app. What are some steps that suppliers have to do prior to that? Yeah, so a couple things for the, for the Spark Lite application. Uh, you have to be a valid supplier. You have to have a, have a vendor of record and actually be working with Walmart. Uh, that's available today, and you can log on to the walmartsupplierportal.com and be able to do that. 
if you are interested in having Spark 2, which is both the viewing of information as well as taking action, you need two things. You need to be a, a qualified or a valid vendor of record for Walmart. And secondly, you have to have a merchant contact that's recommending that you do this work in our stores or supporting the fact that you're going to do this work in our stores. And who would a merchant contact be? Anybody in merchandising could be a buyer, could be a DMM, could be a you know senior vice president, whatever level you want to do. We've got uh, our merchants are very, very excited about this, and so they're very actively involved with this program. So if a supplier is interested and they have retail coverage uh, that are covering our stores today, I think a quick discussion with them and we would be able to get them turned on pretty quickly. Yeah, how do you see this improving overall on-shelf availability? You said it's going to, but how, what are some steps and what are some key metrics there that should improve on-shelf availability? Yeah, I, I think, you know, our, our business is, is a very, very uh, good one in terms of getting merchandise on the floor. Uh, but it also requires that there are certain triggers at the store that absolutely positively have to be right. Uh, for example, a product has to have a label, it has to have a home, or when our nut stocking folks come to stock the product, they don't know where it goes. And so the product ends up going in the back room. Um, secondly, yes, we, if we have ghost inventory, which is, a, it says we have 30 or something, but we don't really have any of it. Well, we don't sell any because we don't have any, and we don't order any because we think we have 30. So giving these suppliers the ability to use the real-time data that we're giving them and then take action on that to recommend on-hand changes to our stores allows that system to start getting us back into stock. Okay, Bill, I want to go to you now. How have suppliers that you've been piloting this with, how have they kind of embraced the digital technology and this application? I think uh, suppliers are waking up to the fact that in order to be you know, a true partner with Walmart moving forward, they're going to have to embrace digital. I mean, they're already in stores. I mean, you look, look at BYOD, bring your own device. They're already in stores with, with these devices. And when you look at kind of the evolution of digital, a lot of times the focus has always been on like the front end app, the shopping app. And so the back end operations piece has always kind of been, been a secondary thought. And so now you're really blending operational excellence with the insight delivery piece and now coming together to do that. You almost have to, you, you think about the, the evolution of the supplier relationship with Walmart and what was it first? It was, they just gotta be here, they need to be close, it was proximity based. And then Retail Link comes out and then it was about being uh, you know, a database relationship. Then insights became the new currency, provide insight to where the category is gonna be five years from now. And now, suppliers are looking at it saying, to be a, to be a Truly a, a deep, deeply seated partner with Walmart, it's got to be an action-based relationship. We've got to be able to react immediately, not just, you know, not just necessarily be, be reactionary to reports that may have come out, as Mike said, six hours, tw 12 hours, 24 hours old. We've got to be able to do something immediately. And I think the exciting thing for the, the, the supplier portal is that you can now do something, is that you know, it, it's not replacing human, human interaction. You're actually right there with your rep, with the store associate, actually doing something there at the shelf and being able to impact it. This is kind of a change for Rockfish because you guys have developed a lot of apps. P.F. Chang's, I know we've talked about that one. How does this change the game for Rockfish? Yeah, I mean, for, for us, it's, it's again, it's, it's, it's beginning to, to say the back-end operations piece is, is going to be a key driver to improving OSA. I mean, there's always going to be focus on the end consumer and making that shopping experience easier and easier. But now being able to, 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 to blend that together is, is truly game-changing to, to be out a part of that. I mean, you've got all these different data sources that are so great at looking in the rearview mirror. Now, you know, use that mobile device, do something proactive right there at the shelf. Mike, how does this impact the stores? And what, what changes today, because now you have all these suppliers in there, they're going to be requesting on-hand changes or requesting that something be ordered. How is that going to impact the stores? Yeah, a couple things. First off, we recognize that the people who are going to be in the store, whether they are Walmart associates or these suppliers, we actually partner with a third party called Volt. They're getting extensive training on our system, so they know our systems as well as our associates do, and they actually are certified. They, we have to pass a test that they know what they're doing. Number two, this allows our associates to do what they do really well, take care of customers, stock shelf, get new item and merchandise on the shelves, and the suppliers are also trying to do their task. It frees them up because they're not having to stop and go scan an item for a supplier or go make a pick or make a shelf label, et cetera. It gives them the ability to do those tasks that they're in the store to do uh, without having to have constant interaction with our suppliers. Okay, and now I want to go to Michael. Michael, you're with Kellogg's. You've been doing this for a while. You're involved with the pilot. What kind of results are, is Kellogg's seeing? You know, Kellogg's is definitely seeing measurable results in those stores. And we feel like it's a direct reflection of OSA improvements. Um, to the point that, I mean, we're excited about this expanding because of the results we've had in, in those stores. The other great thing is we've seen this, this shift in partnership and collaboration in store. Um, you mentioned earlier about 
Um, you know, what happens when reps come in, just start making on-hand changes. Um, the best thing we've seen in these stores has been so much more of the dialogue and conversation that reps have been having with, with store management. Um, part of it is they've been having to borrow a Telzon in this store, but it's been, uh, it's been you know, Mr. and Mrs. Store Manager, I'm in your store to service it today, here's what I'm going to be taking care of. And then when they've returned the Telzon, it's um, here's the things I was able to accomplish today. Here's where the four or five out of stocks I had. Um, I was able to pick a couple of the items. I was able to print a new tag for this one. And, and this one, we had some phantom inventory. So um, that dialogue has caused this incredible increased collaboration and partnership that when you talk to the, the store management in, in those markets, um, that's been the biggest win for them. Um, so for us, we're very excited about it because we've seen not only results, but we've also seen just an improved partnership at store level. Okay, Mike, I wanna go back to you. Who's gonna manage supplier schedules? And when suppliers can go in stores or they're in stores, do you, I know here locally that can oftentimes be a problem. We have so many suppliers that go into the store, they start giving so much direction, tearing things up. Who's going to manage that at store level? Well, real importantly, it's not Walmart's job to manage those schedules, okay? We're, we're in no way, shape, or form directing any of their tasks. That's not what we're about. We recognize that when Kellogg's going to come in on a certain schedule to, do, to perform their work, that that's kind of a cadence that that store is used to. Uh, and we expect them to continue that cadence as they always have. The only thing this really changes is the fact that we're going to give them technology and tools to allow them to do their work much more effectively. Okay, so Mike, if, if I'm ready to get trained on this, what are the steps I've got to take to do that as a supplier? Yeah, for the Spark Light that I just mentioned, uh, which is inventory viewing only, uh, number one, you need to be a registered supplier with Walmart, and number two, you need to log on and, and, to www.supplierportal.com. Uh, get registered, uh, and there is an annual fee for this, and you, there's an online training that you take, there's an online certification that you take, and then you would be able to download that particular application on your either Android or iPhone device, and you start using the application. Okay, Bill, how is this, pro this whole program developed? Because oftentimes it seems like, from a supply perspective, and I've been at Walmart too, where you develop something and whether you're doing it for a store, right. they think you're living in the Crystal Palace up here. Um, developing stuff that may not have any application. How, what was the process for Rockfish in developing this application? Well, I think the important thing is to know that it wasn't developed in a vacuum. I mean, first of all, you had the first iteration of Spark, you know, on that handheld device that was actually in the store that was a, you know, Tide Truden tested program that was already, uh, already had a baseline foundation built. The big piece of moving to Sparklight and Spark 2.0 was becoming untethered and actually, again, using those devices that were already being in stores together. So I think um, the true success for this, 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 this whole project has been the collaboration board. I mean, you've had a number of suppliers have enormous input in this. I mean, these are suppliers that had nothing to do with each other, on completely opposite ends of the store as far as merchandise goes, rolling up their sleeves together, working in concert with ISD, working in concert with, with uh, operations, with, with merchandising. And I mean, it's had, it's had multiple, multiple input points. I mean, you add in the whole third-party retail service piece, and I mean, you've got a full 360-degree view of what was happening in the stores. Okay, and Michael, one uh, final question for you. What would you tell another supplier who's, who's thinking about this or may not have ever heard of Spark? Is this worth the investment to get into? I would say absolutely it is because um, Kellogg's, like I'm sure a lot of other suppliers, um, have spent a lot of time trying to find ways to drive on shelf availability at Walmart. And there are times we go in stores and depending on the time of day, depending on the availability of associates, we may not be able to fix an out of stock. Um, to have a tool that's actionable, real time, um, and, and, and a, a tool to help make sure we're getting all of our products available for our consumers um, is invaluable. So if you're a supplier that, that's, that's thinking about this, is kicking it around, it absolutely makes sense because the number one priority for, for Walmart um, is the number one priority for Kellogg's and probably is the number one priority for other suppliers, which is driving on shelf availability, making sure all of our products are available for our consumers every day. This is just another tool. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. We are out of time, and we pr I appreciate you guys coming in and talking about that, and thank you for taking the time for joining us, and we will look forward to seeing you next Saturday morning.